Welcome to Future of Freedom. I'm your host, Scott Bertram. Future of Freedom is a production of America's Talking Network. You can check out all of our great podcasts at americastalking.com. To support great podcasts like this one, please donate by clicking the link in the show description. We bring you interviews today from different sides of the debate over our approach to homelessness. In a little bit, we'll be joined by Mary Thoreau, chairman of the board of directors and CEO of the Independent Institute. More at independent.org. First, we talk with Mark Calabria, senior advisor at the Cato Institute. More at cato.org. Mark, thanks for joining us. That's Scott. It's a real pleasure. Discussing uh, the approach uh, approaches to homelessness and the homeless epidemic that is in some of our cities across the country. I wanted to start by asking about this idea of of housing first, uh, officially under the Obama administration, uh, housing and urban development changed the policy in 2013 to something called housing first. How, how do you define that? And then do you think that's the right approach to begin with? So it's a great question. And I believe the way to be, I want to try to be as fair as possible to the Obama folks. Uh, the way housing first is defined as was implemented under the Obama administration is a view that let's try to get the homeless individual into a housing unit uh, as soon as possible and then deal with whatever issues, whether it's mental health, substance abuse, let's deal with their other issues second. So the housing first really is meant to be a kind of sequencing. Get them in, uh, deal with the other issues later. It tends to also be seen as an alternative to a reliance on, say, shelters. So it tends to be a little bit more like we're going to try to get you an apartment rather than deal with, say, you know, you need a couple of the nights in a shelter. So I think that's a fair way to think about it. Um, and that really has has been primarily yeah, – actually, some of this even started in the Bush years. But again, it was ramped up and really focused upon uh, in the Obama years. What have you seen in terms of outcome results if you want to, you know, you said it's kind of a sequence, housing first, uh, treatment, help second. What about flipping that? Is there an argument for treatment first, uh, attacking the underlying issues first, and then moving on to the housing question? So I, I think where I, you know, maybe if you if you want, maybe think about three different kind of aspects, on perhaps views on this. You know, let's take the housing first where, you know, and this has been tried in a number of places where again, you've got an apartment, you're getting the uh, homeless individual in there, and then you're bringing services. And then a number of other approaches try to deal with, you know, let's deal with mental health for, you know, let's deal, for instance, um, we know a, a, a terribly large percentage of our chronic homelessness are veterans. So whether they're dealing with PTSD or other health issues, are you going to deal with that through, for instance, veterans health care? Are you going to deal with that homelessness? Uh, and then there's an uh, approach that I think that sometimes is forgotten, which is dealing with the overall housing market as well. So mm -hmm. housing first has often been the focus in places like California, where it's extremely difficult to get housing. So in some sense, you know, my position would be more, let's fix the housing market. And so we don't necessarily need to focus on making the units available per se, but we can focus on providing services directly dealing with, say, the substance abuse and mental health issues that are also contributing to, to homelessness, but that you need to fix the underlying housing problem. And, and so somewhat, I think the Housing first is is meant to be kind of a band aid to deal with the fact that in many housing markets it, it just doesn't work. Whereas in other housing markets, if we were talking about, you know, first of all, starting that obviously uh, homelessness is much less an issue in say Dallas than it is San Francisco. Well, in a place like Dallas, where arguably there's apartment construction, there is building available, you can focus a little bit more on the first end on uh, the mental health and drug abuse issues that'll contribute. And of course, it's also important to keep in mind a separation of between, you know, acute chronic homelessness. Um, you know, we often think about homelessness and identify it with single men sleeping on a park bench. Uh, it's a very different problem in rural America where it could be a family sleeping in a barn or, you know, crowd surfing. And I think a overwhelming issue is to try to think about, A, um, whatever the cause of homelessness, 
whether it is, again, substance abuse, whether it's mental health, whether it is a woman fleeing an abusive partner, all of these things become easier to address if you have a healthy housing market. And to me, I think that's what sometimes lost, you know, in both the housing first as well as the the, the alternative mm-hmm. uh, approaches to dealing with housing is everything else gets easier if, you know, there are available affordable apartments. Are, are the hurdles to housing in some of our urban areas the same kind of hurdles we would hear about for the non-homeless population when we when we hear about housing shortages and people finding it difficult to to locate places to buy or places to rent? Are, are the hurdles the same in both areas? Absolutely. 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 I mean, so the places you see. Again, we think about coastal coastal California. We think about, you know, the, the northeast. And of course, unfortunately, some of these practices, you know, are spreading uh, to the interior of the country where it's becoming harder to build. It's becoming harder to get development. And certainly there are other areas that are going the other direction. And, you know, Montana has been doing some fascinating things on trying to deregulate their housing market. But overall, and, and again, if you kind of think about it, when you have a multitude of other issues to deal with, whatever they are in your life, if you cannot find a place to live or you have to uh, spend a disproportionate amount of your income, if you're spending half you know, your income on your rent or, or your mortgage in some areas, then that makes it a whole lot more difficult to deal with other issues you make. And of course, if you, have, if you don't even have stable housing. So it's certainly not hard to imagine that there would be individuals uh, struggling with mental health issues who in a stable housing situation may very well be able to get those issues under control. So, for instance, if you think about there may be mental health issues that can be um, addressed uh, with pharmaceutical interventions. Well, if you're sleeping on the street. Where are you storing your 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 pills to take? Mm-hmm. So again, these it's just a a, a, port, a a point of when it's difficult to find housing. Dealing with many of the other issues uh, become even more difficult. And and in fact, I would this is why I mean to me, I often get sometimes frustrated when the argument, well, it's it's housing or it's not housing or it's mental health, it's not mental. It, it's all of the above, and, and it's compounding factors. Uh, that make dealing any one of those issues far more difficult. But I think that if we can try to essentially make, you know, if you will, more of our housing markets look like Texas, where it's easy to build, generally affordable, that's not going to solve all your problems, but it'll solve a lot of your problems and it makes many problems easier to deal with. Cato has a uh, study at Cato.org looking at various locations under these housing first policies. Utah and California saw results that were not encouraging. You mentioned Texas. Looking at Houston, Houston did see decent results. And Cato says that's because of low cost housing and an elastic housing supply. What has Houston done in their housing market that perhaps other locations can learn from? It might be easier to say what they haven't done. <laughs> they haven't <laughs> overregulated it. Uh, you know, it, it, a lot of it is can you build different types? And so Houston, of course, is um, a bit of an interesting case study because it doesn't have traditional zoning. There are uh, somewhat covenant restrictions on neighborhoods, but it doesn't have the traditional zoning we think about many other cities, even many other cities in, in Texas. Uh, and so a a wide variety of uses allowed. So somewhat you allow the neighborhoods to be organic if housing, because you know, home single family homes may get replaced by apartments or duplexes. Um, you don't, even importantly, you may allow certain types of homes, but you have a clear light at the end of the tunnel for the builder. So part of the problem in California, for instance, and this is just, um, there are so many veto points. So even if you as a developer start out a project in California and you think you can build, but there are multiple avenues, particularly under California's environmental laws, where you can get litigated, it can be sued, it can drag out forever. So generally, if you start a project, if you start building uh, a single family home or apartment in Texas, you generally know you're going to be able to finish it. Mm-hmm. You, you generally know that someone is going to be living there at some at some point. You don't know that in most of California. Again, it, it is it is rolling the dice on whether you'll ever be able to finish the project. And of course, um, time is money. If you add months, years to a construction project, that can often make something you know viable become non-viable. And so the reason why, to me, 
the sort of more Texas approach or Montana approach or much really of the of the Midwest approach works is because it's a it's a pro growth environment. It is an environment where housing is not going to take up a lot of your income. Mm-hmm. Um, it is also an environment where jobs are created. Uh, you can live closer to where you need to work because you can afford to live there. Uh, and again, if you have that healthy economy and healthy that job market, that doesn't fix every single problem. But for instance, um, you know, a lot of mental health issues may come from lack of attachment to the labor market, which of course runs both ways. And so in some place like Texas, you can find an affordable apartment, you can find an entry level job or, or, or a well paying job relative to the cost. Uh, and again, I think that helps give your life direction and can maybe help transition. For instance, as I had mentioned before, a terrifyingly large percentage of our chronic homeless population of veterans. And part of this does come from the inability to help them reconnect to civilian life. And if you can't find a place to live, it's very hard to do that. This is not to say, again, the the, the housing first approach really has been, in my opinion, kind of an attempt to band-aid what are dysfunctional housing markets. And so if you don't fix the overall housing market, the housing of first approaches tend to be extremely expensive. Mm-hmm. And they tend to, because they often, you know, if you've kind of touched upon, you know, they downplay the secondary considerations, as I mentioned, such as mental health or substance abuse. Because again, it's the, the I think the intent of let's get somebody on their feet with a place to live is the right one. I think, again, the right approach, however, is to liberalize the housing market in a way where the private sector can come come in and build that. Um, and then thinking about how do you deal with the, the host of other issues uh, that may be contributing to somebody's housing instability. What about those costs? You mentioned the expense, and certainly in some areas, we're talking about California, San Francisco, just the cost of building these structures to to, to house homeless uh, is going to add up very quickly. Have we seen the costs needed to address this problem increase under under a housing first sort of philosophy? It's really, you know, I mean, to me, it's it's simply stunning. You know, you, you've had I mean, these may be a little more in the high end, but you know, you've had assisted units built in the Bay Area of California that have cost a million dollars. I mean, so a million dollars for an apartment for someone to be in, um, and obviously, you know, every you know that's money we're not spending elsewhere. Um, and so, unfortunately, this is one of the problems with how housing first has been implemented in many cities. It's been done very much through a, a sort of New Deal style assisted housing where it be, ends up being very costly. You've got to pay prevailing wages. Uh, so your labor costs are pretty high. You know, you, you're because you're doing this through the assisted route, you're providing you know a lot of money to lawyers and people who put the deals together. And so it really is a process where, you know, the subsidies that are ultimately ultimately being provided uh, via the federal government and and often the state and local government are simply being eaten up. And this is one reason why I I prefer, again, the sort of Texas approach of if you let the market build apartments and then, you know, maybe you you, you have to find and there's a whole uh, there's a whole voucher framework specifically for veterans, for instance, experiencing homelessness, that you can rely on the private sector to build these projects efficiently um, or at least much more affordably. And that way your dollars go a lot further. And this is one of the problems. It's, you know, the housing first approach that, again, has been heavily relied on. It's almost kind of like an lottery. <laughs> if you win, we're going to spend a lot of deep subsidies on you. Uh, but if you don't, you're completely out. Uh, and to me, I don't think, I mean, fundamentally, I don't think it's a fair approach. I'm sure that the uh, advocates of it would retort, well, we're just not spending enough money on it. Uh, and again, the problem is that so much of the subsidy gets eaten up. Again, if we're at a point where it's costing on occasion as much as a million dollars to build an apartment, uh, and that's including the subsidies uh, in the Bay Area of California, that reflects a far deeper fundamental problem. And we've got to fix those issues. So to me, rather than taking the the housing first approach that has been, and of course, it's also important to keep in mind that that's specifically targeting chronic homelessness. There's a tremendous amount of unfortunate homelessness where you know, the person doesn't need six months. They're they're in the middle of cal surfing, um, you know, or, or whether they're fleeing, you know, could be, a, again, a spouse fleeing an abusive situation and needs to be in a woman's shelter uh, for a couple of days. So there could be, you know, situations where people are experiencing homelessness for a short amount of time. 
Uh, and the housing first really is focused on long-term chronic homelessness. Uh, and again, it's a one size fits all heavily uh, deep subsidy for a small number of population. And so I, I don't think it's a terribly efficient and it really has not worked well, partly because it is so focused on a small number of individuals that its impact on bringing down shelter populations have been modest. But again, modest partly because it's been targeted in housing markets uh, that are fundamentally dysfunctional to begin with. The housing first policy has been in effect in in Washington since 2013. We now live in what we would call a post-COVID environment. Do, Do you see, is it a different type of homelessness today that needs a different type of response than perhaps the one that was deemed to be correct 11 years ago? Well, let me first say that, you know, and again, I was have been following these issues off and on for, you know, a number of times and spent time on Capitol Hill working on McKinney Vento and other homelessness assistance programs. I, 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 w- I would have said, you know, even then 10 years ago, it wasn't the right approach then. Um, it was a very tailored approach that a few advocates and academics were heavily pushing and, and really kind of focused. It resonated, you know, with some outsized voices. But it was, I don't think, there, I mean, there was never really a consensus behind it. Um, it was something that, again, was very targeted. And there are multiple reasons that any that, that, someone, that someone or a family may be experiencing homelessness. And so this is really a one-size-fits-all that really deals with the very urbanized. So part of the problem, of course, is so much homelessness policy gets driven by, you know, kind of what we think, what somebody thinks may work in New York City. And that's not the same thing that, A, it may not even work in New York City, (laughs) but it's really being driven by a, you know, single men sleeping on park benches in an urban area perspective, whereas homelessness in suburban and rural America is very different, very different. It tends to be much more family oriented. It tends to be more short term. It often tends to be, you know, predominantly an affordability issue. Um, And so, again, even if you thought housing first was the right approach for a New York or San Francisco, which, again, I don't believe it is, but even if you thought it was, that in no way implies it's going to be the right approach for Oklahoma City or Des Moines. Mark Calabria is senior advisor to the Cato Institute. You can find more at Cato.org. Mark, thanks so much for joining us here on Future of Freedom. Scott, it was really my pleasure. Thank you. Now to hear another side of the discussion about our approach to homelessness, we talk with Mary Thoreau. Chairman of the Board of Directors and CEO at the Independent Institute, more at independent.org. Mary, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate your time today as we discuss uh, the homeless issue, how we address it, and perhaps what changes are needed. Uh, Since 2013, under the Obama administration, Housing and Urban Development has had a uh, a goal, uh, the priority of housing first. And I wanted to begin by asking how you think that housing first approach has worked and is it a, a proper approach to the issue of homelessness? Well, the numbers speak for themselves. Homelessness has exploded. They claim that when they introduced housing first that they would end homelessness in 10 years and instead it's gone up many multiples across the country. So it's clearly not working. Um, And it's based on a complete misunderstanding of the issue. First of all, the word homelessness implies that people are living in the streets simply because they don't have homes. And if you give them a house, you've solved the problem. But people are not living in the streets because they don't have homes. They're living in the streets for a great many different reasons. and you have to address those underlying causes before people can uh, get housed and stay housed successfully. I know that the Independent Institute has done some research and some work. We'll get into a lot of that. When it comes to the reasons that people find themselves homeless, what have you found to be those top three, top four reasons? Well, a lot of it is rooted in trauma. Um, there's quite a bit of childhood trauma arising out of, uh, you know, just bad family structures that we have in this country. I've talked to many people and uh, frankly, in talking to them, I think if if I'd had a childhood like that, I'd be in the streets using self-medicating with drugs too. Um, It can also be a a trauma as an adult. Um, People get hospitalized. Um, One man I talked to was hospitalized. He was uh, 
prescribed oxycodone when he came out and ended up addicted and homeless in the streets. Mental illness plays a huge part of it. Uh, but the problem with today's drugs is even marijuana is they're so strong that they themselves can induce psychosis. So it's sort of a vicious circle of whether it's addiction or mental illness. It's oftentimes both. There's a line in one of the independent, I think it's from the Beyond Homeless uh, executive summary, in fact, that says housing first means death second because people are warehoused and then slowly die from untreated addictions. Why does the second part of that equation not come through? If the housing is first, why does, why does treatment not work second? Well, right. I mean, the theory in the name Housing First does imply that there's going to be services provided. But the reality is that housing is so expensive, government provided housing, it takes years and years to build. And it's uh, in California, it's now more than a million dollars per unit, which means per person you get housed. So there's very little of it. And it's very expensive. So there is not resources put into the services that people need. Really, people need to get stabilized. They need their underlying uh, uh, underlying issues addressed before they can be successfully housed independently. Often now, if they're housed independently and they're isolated, they're dying at higher rates than if they're in the streets because if somebody overdoses in the street, somebody is nearby and sees them and can uh, give them Narcan to reverse the overdose. Mm -hmm. If they're alone in a, in a room somewhere and they overdose, nobody sees them and they die. And that's what we're seeing here in San Francisco is tremendous numbers of people dying of overdoses, two thirds of whom are housed. Mary Thoreau with us from the Independent Institute, more at independent.org. If not housing first, what should be, what could be an approach, the primary approach to dealing with this problem? Well, the very successful method that we highlight in our documentary called Beyond Homeless, Finding Hope is in San Antonio, Texas called Haven for Hope. It's been operating for 13 years and it's exactly the opposite of Housing First. So it's a 22 acre campus right next to downtown San Antonio. Um, they have both a low barrier, what's called a low barrier shelter, which means you don't have to be sober. Um, you, you cannot use on campus, but it's a safe place to sleep essentially with access to services should you choose to access them. The larger part of the campus is called the transformational campus, and that's residential, sober living with 140 nonprofits offering their services on site. So people can come in, They'll interview them, find out what their story is, what they need, and you have 140 nonprofits ready, willing, and able to come alongside that individual or that family and help them overcome the barriers that put them into homelessness in the first place so that they can then be successful, achieve their full potential, and go on to be successfully employed and housed independently. Does that kind of approach and perhaps that that specific example, does it require uh, the, the buy-in and the participation of that many more nonprofits? Does it work better when there are more nonprofits involved and perhaps less government involved? Yes, and really the takeaway from Haven for Hope is the fact that it is a community-wide approach. Um, it's a very, in our parlance, um, as Alexis Tocqueville mm -hmm described America in the early 19th century of where we wouldn't look to the government to solve our problems. We'd come together to build schools, libraries, whatever we needed. And that's what San Antonio did. Um, an oil man became, a, became aware of the homelessness problem. He called up the mayor, whose election, by the way, he had opposed uh, because the mayor had spoken out about homelessness and the, the oil man said, are you really serious about doing something about homelessness? The mayor said, yes, I am. Um, the businessman said, well, I want to help. The mayor made him the chairman of a task force. The task force then was comprised of every segment of the community, the police, fire, EMS, the hospitals, again, 140 nonprofits. So it's a very collaborative um, community-based 
method that's been very successful where they coordinate services in almost every other community. Everybody is in silos and they're working at cross purposes at worst or just in parallel duplicating and so on. So it's really the collaboration that's the success and the fact that they are all contributing um, what they are best at contributing and doing so on a very, again, individualized basis, mm -hmm. what that individual or what that family needs. How realistic is it to duplicate that sort of environment in cities and states across the country? How, how do you remain nimble and flexible enough to, to sort of customize that to, to individual areas and then also customize treatment to so many individual uh, patients who need that assistance? <clears throat> Well, Haven operates as an independent 501c3, so they're very transparent. They learn constantly and adjust constantly. Um, they're always adding and dropping partners who work with them. We've been working with the people who were behind creating Haven uh, here in San Francisco for an adapted model that we can do here. Uh, it won't be a 22-acre campus on which uh, all of these nonprofits are actually located, but it's uh, evolved into what's called a hub and spoke model. Mm. So we'll have a centralized hub where people can be brought to be triaged, essentially have their immediate needs dealt with, get stabilized, and then get referred to spokes, which are the uh, services out in the community where they can get the uh, individualized help that they need. But the important part is that all of the nonprofits and all of the agencies are connected together through this hub and spoke model. Again, replicating that coordination, that communication, uh, that sense of community that's going to address the problem. So we're very hopeful that we'll get that implemented here in San Francisco and can then be a model for other communities around the country. What do we know thus far about long-term implications of what's happened at Haven for Hope? Does it reduce the recurrence of homelessness in the future? Does it help to promote uh, additional housing stability in the future? Do we know anything like that quite yet? Oh, absolutely. It's been operating for 13 years, and they've reduced downtown unsheltered homelessness by 77% and countywide by 11%. So it's a very stark example of how taking the exact opposite approach to housing first is very effective. And here in San Francisco, which has parroted the federal model of housing first for the past 10, 11 years, we've seen homelessness go up by 80%. So <laughs> it's like, um, it, it, read it and weep almost. It's almost... It, can't believe that people continue to do this insanity when there are very good examples of the opposite approach working very well. Uh, har uh, housing first programs often utilize a harm reduction approach to the treatment of substance abuse. That's sometimes supervised injection or syringe distribution or needle exchange. What does that approach fail to address? And is it, is it done differently inside of, of this holistic approach? So harm reduction is pretty much a misnomer too. Um, what they're trying to, what it, what it really does is they're attempting to reduce the harm of using drugs by doing things like handing out uh, doses of Narcan to reverse uh, overdoses, uh, giving out pamphlets showing how to smoke fentanyl safely. Um, there was actually a campaign here in San Francisco about, you know, use, use, do fentanyl with a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the real heart reduction from uh, harm caused by drugs is recovery, right? And it, when it's not coupled with, uh, with access to recovery, it's just perpetuating addiction and death because the end point of addiction is death unless you do recovery. So you have to have a recovery-based model, and um, that's what Haven does. The transformational campus is sober. Um, they will work with people that they understand that relapses happen, and they'll work with you to kind of reset and try again. But ultimately, the goal is to get rid of, get over your addiction and lead a full and complete and free life. 
Mary, you wrote in a recent piece in the San Francisco Examiner that permanent support of housing too often means bringing individuals with their problems indoors. As one social worker put it, they're inside, but culturally homeless. What about that culture that needs to be uh, designed and, 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 and built? Where does the support come from down the road? Well, recovery is the first step, and then uh, creating community. Um, one man with whom I spoke about, I asked him to just, you know, what's homelessness like? And he said, it's very lonely. And, you know, you see these encampments and you assume that that's a community, but they, they really aren't. They're very dysfunctional communities. So when you simply move people inside, you're moving all of that dysfunction into four walls. And the damage in these in these for housing first buildings is just tremendous. They they get destroyed because people unfortunately have very severe problems, severe mental illness, severe addiction, and they trash their living spaces. Um, there are fires. One uh, captain with the San Francisco Fire Department, they get called to these places all the time because people are in, are having psychotic. Um, episodes, they're on the roof threatening to jump, they're just disarray, um, you know, called these places, a place where the homeless go to die. Um, so it is, it's a, it's a culture of disorder and you have to help people restore order to their lives and learn how to, well, you know, transform their lives to achieve their full potential as human beings, as God's created beings. Mary, in the uh, Beyond Homeless executive summary, which people can find at independent.org, there are some recommendations toward the end. One that I was interested in learning more about is uh, re-examining conservatorship laws. What might need to be done on that subject? Right. Well, we all agree that the last thing we want is the state taking charge of people and and having charge of their freedom and and treatment and so on. But ultimately, so we we try to set up systems where people are motivated to get care. Um, but ultimately, there are some people for whom conservatorship is really necessary. They are incapable of making uh, choices. They're incapable of living independently. And they need a full hospital environment and may need to be uh, ordered there by court. Uh, You can have very good safeguards in place where independent um, doctors are conducting analyses, you know, annually or every six months or whatever to ensure, to determine whether or not the person needs to stay in conservatorship or can live on a step-down basis. So we can have safeguards and we have to have safeguards, but ultimately um, there's a small number of people who who need a full residential care, custodial care. And finally, I wanted to ask about what's happening in Wichita. This is just uh, a couple of weeks ago. In fact, you wrote a piece that's in the Wichita Eagle Sun, also independent.org. Wichita is following in this model we discussed previously in San Antonio. What needed to come together for a place like Wichita to uh, address homelessness in this way? Well, and it's still coming together. So there's a family uh, there who's put up the land and and a certain amount of the money to create a 70-acre campus called One Rise um, in Wichita. And it's been in the works for, oh, I think about four years now. And again, it's a matter of bringing all of the sectors of the community together to work in concert around a connected model. In this case, it will be a fully residential model um, with lots and lots of services available. But they're still having to do it. There's still some. There's still some disagreement. Of you know, some people are are going full bore on. No, we need to create housing first um, environments, and others are are proposing other models. So it's very much a work in progress, but they are making progress and I'm hopeful that it's going to come to fruition, um, ideally, hopefully sooner than later. Mary Thoreau is with us. She is chairman of the board of directors and CEO at the Independent Institute. You can find more at independent.org. Mary, thanks so much for joining us here on Future of Freedom. Thank you. And we also have a separate website called beyondhomeless.org, which has a lot of this information just all together. So thank you so much. 
We thank both of our guests for being here today, Mark Calabria, Senior Advisor at the Cato Institute, and Mary Thoreau, Chairman of the Board of Directors and CEO at the Independent Institute. For additional episodes of the Future of Freedom podcast and other fine podcasts from America's Talking Network, check out americastalking.com or anywhere you find your audio. Thank you for listening to Future of Freedom, presented by America's Talking Network.